This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ian Bartholomew. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Four, Part Eight. The villainy of Dangerfield had not, like that of Oates, destroyed many innocent victims. For Dangerfield had not taken up the trade of a witness till the plot had been blown upon, and till juries had become incredulous. He was brought to trial, not for perjury, but for the less heinous offence of libel. He had, during the agitation caused by the Exclusion Bill, put forth a narrative containing some false and odious imputations on the late and on the present King. For this publication he was now, after the lapse of five years, suddenly taken up, brought before the Privy Council, committed, tried, convicted, and sentenced to be whipped from Oldgate to Newgate, and from Newgate to Tyburn. The wretched man behaved with great effrontery during the trial, but, when he heard his doom, he went into agonies of despair, gave himself up for dead, and chose a text for his funeral sermon. His forebodings were just. He was not, indeed, scourged quite so severely as Oates had been, but he had not Oates's iron strength of body and mind. After the execution, Dangerfield was put into a hackney coach and was taken back to prison. As he passed the corner of Hatton Garden, a Tory gentleman of Gray's Inn, named Francis, stopped the carriage, and cried out with brutal levity, "'Well, friend, have you had your heat this morning?' The bleeding prisoner, maddened by his insult, answered with a curse. Francis instantly struck him in the face with a cane, which injured the eye. Dangerfield was carried dying into Newgate. This dastardly outrage roused the indignation of the bystanders. They seized Francis, and were with difficulty restrained from tearing him to pieces. The appearance of Dangerfield's body— which had been frightfully lacerated by the whip, inclined many to believe that his death was chiefly, if not wholly, caused by the stripes which he had received. The government and the Chief Justice thought it convenient to lay the whole blame on Francis, who, though he seems to have been at worst guilty of aggravated manslaughter, was tried and executed for murder. His dying speech is one of the most curious moments of that age. The savage spirit which had brought him to the gallows remained with him to the last. Boasts of his loyalty and abuse of the Whigs were mingled with the parting ejaculations in which he commended his soul to the divine mercy. An idle rumour had been circulated that his wife was in love with Dangerfield, who was eminently handsome and renowned for gallantry. The fatal blow, it was said, had been prompted by jealousy. The dying husband, with an earnestness, half ridiculous, half pathetic, vindicated the lady's character. She was, he said, a virtuous woman, she came of a loyal stock, and, if she had been inclined to break her marriage vow, would at least have selected a Tory and a churchman for her paramour. About the same time a culprit, who bore very little resemblance to Oates or Dangerfield, appeared on the floor of the courts of King's Bench. No eminent chief of a party has ever passed through many years of civil and religious dissension with more innocence than Richard Baxter. He belonged to the mildest and most temperate section of the Puritan body. He was a young man when the Civil War broke out. He thought that the right was on the side of the houses, and he had no scruple about acting as chaplain to a regiment in the parliamentary army. But his clear and somewhat sceptical understanding, and his strong sense of justice, preserved him from all excesses. He exerted himself to check the fanatical violence of the soldiery. He condemned the proceedings of the High Court of Justice. In the days of the Commonwealth he had the boldness to express, on many occasions, and once even in Cromwell's presence, love and reverence for the ancient institutions of the country. While the royal family was in exile, Baxter's life was chiefly passed at Kidderminster in the assiduous discharge of parochial duties. He heartily concurred in the restoration and was sincerely desirous to bring about an union between Episcopalians and Presbyterians. For with a liberty rare in his time, he considered questions of ecclesiastical policy as of small account when compared with the great principles of Christianity, and had never, even when prelacy was most odious to the ruling powers, joined in the outcry against bishops. The attempt to reconcile the contending factions failed, 
Baxter cast in his lot with his prescribed friends, refused the mitre of Hereford, quitted the parsonage of Kidderminster, and gave himself up almost wholly to study. His theological writings, though too moderate to be pleasing to the bigots of any party, had an immense reputation. Zealous churchmen called him a roundhead, and many nonconformists accused him of Erastianism or Arminianism. But the integrity of his heart, the purity of his life, and the vigour of his faculties, and the extent of his attainments were acknowledged by the best and wisest men of every persuasion. His political opinions, in spite of the oppression which he and his brethren suffered, were moderate. He was friendly to that small party which was hated by both Whigs and Tories. He could not, he said, join in cursing the trimmers, when he remembered who it was that had blessed the peacemakers. In a commentary on the New Testament he had complained, with some bitterness, of the persecution which the dissenters suffered, that men who, for not using the prayer-book, had been driven from their homes, stripped of their property, and locked up in dungeons, should dare to utter a murmur, was then thought a high crime against the state and the church. Roger Lestrange, the champion of the government, and the oracle of the clergy, sounded the note of war in the observator, and information was filed. Baxter begged that he might be allowed some time to prepare for his defence. It was on the day on which Oates was pilloried in Palace Yard that the illustrious chief of the Puritans, oppressed by age and infirmities, came to Westminster Hall to make this request. Jeffreys burst into a storm of rage. "'Not a minute!' he cried. "'To save his life, I can deal with saints as well as with sinners. There stands Oates on one side of the pillory, and if Baxter stood on the other, the two greatest rogues in the kingdom would stand together.' When the trial came on to Guildhall, a crowd of those who loved and honoured Baxter filled the court. At his side stood Dr. William Bates, one of the most eminent of the nonconformist divines. Two Whig barristers of great note, Polexfen and Wallop, appeared for the defendant. Polexfen had scarcely begun his address to the jury, when the Chief Justice broke forth. Polexfen, I know you well. I will set a mark on you. You are the patron of the faction. This is an old rogue, a schismatical knave, a hypocritical villain. He hates the liturgy. He would have nothing but long-winded cant without book. And then his lordship turned up his eyes, clasped his hands, and began to sing through his nose, in imitation of what he supposed to be Baxter's style of praying. Lord, we are thy people, thy peculiar people, thy dear people. Polexfen gently reminded the court that his late majesty had thought Baxter deserving of a bishopric. And what ailed the old blockhead then, cried Jeffreys, that he did not take it? His fury now rose almost to madness. He called Baxter a dog, and swore that it would be no more than justice to whip such a villain through the whole city. Wallop interposed, but fared no better than his leader. "'You are in all these dirty causes, Mr. Wallop,' said the judge. "'Gentlemen of the long robe ought to be ashamed to assist such a factious knave.' The advocate made another attempt to obtain a hearing, but to no purpose. "'If you do not know your duty,' said Jeffreys, "'I will teach it you.' Wallop sat down, and Baxter himself attempted to put in a word. But the Chief Justice drowned all expostulation in a torrent of ribaldry and invective, mingled with scraps of hoodibras. "'My lord,' said the old man, "'I have been much blamed by dissenters for speaking respectfully of bishops.' "'Baxter for bishops!' cried the judge. "'That's a merry conceit, indeed. "'I know what you mean by bishops, rascals like yourself, "'Kidderminster bishops, factious, snivelling Presbyterians.' "'Again Baxter essayed to speak, and again Jeffreys bellowed. "'Richard, Richard, do you think we will let you poison the court? "'Richard, thou art an old knave. "'Thou hast written books enough to load a cart.' and every book as full of sedition as an egg is full of meat. By the grace of God, I'll look after thee. I see a great many of your brotherhood waiting to know what will befall their mighty don. And there, he continued, fixing his savage eyes on Bates, there is a doctor of the party at your elbow. But by the grace of God Almighty, I will crush you all. Baxter held his peace. 
but one of the junior counsel for the defence made a last effort, and undertook to show that the words of which complaint was made would not bear the construction put on them by the information. With this view he began to read the context. In a moment he was roared down. "'You shan't turn the court into a conventicle!' The noise of weeping was heard from some of those who surrounded Baxter. "'Snivelling calves!' said the judge. Witness to character were in attendance, and among them were several clergymen of the established church. But the Chief Justice would hear nothing. "'Does your lordship think,' said Baxter, "'that any jury will convict a man on such a trial as this?' "'I warrant you, Mr. Baxter,' said Jeffreys, "'don't trouble yourself about that.' Jeffreys was right. The sheriffs were the tools of the government. The jurymen, selected by the sheriffs from among the fiercest zealots of the Tory party, conferred for a moment, and returned a verdict of guilty. "'My lord,' said Baxter, as he left the court, "'there was once a Chief Justice who would have treated me very differently.' He alluded to his learned and virtuous friend, Sir Matthew Hale. "'There is not an honest man in England,' answered Jeffreys, "'but looks on thee as a knave.' The sentence was, for those times, a lenient one. What passed in conference among the judges cannot be certainly known. It was believed among the nonconformists, and is highly probable, that the Chief Justice was overruled by his three brethren. He proposed, it is said, that Baxter should be whipped through London at the cart's tail. The majority thought that an eminent divine— who, a quarter of a century before, had been offered a mitre, and who was now in his seventieth year, would be sufficiently punished for a few sharp words by fine and imprisonment. The manner in which Baxter was treated by a judge, who was a member of the cabinet and a favourite of the sovereign, indicated, in a manner not to be mistaken, the feeling with which the government at this time regarded the Protestant nonconformists. But already that feeling had been indicated by still stronger and more terrible signs. The Parliament of Scotland had met. James had purposely hastened the session of this body, and had postponed the session of the English houses, in the hope that the example set at Edinburgh would produce a good effect at Westminster. For the legislature of this northern kingdom was as obsequious as those provincial estates which Louis the Fourteenth still suffered to play at some of their ancient functions in Brittany and Burgundy. None but an Episcopalian could sit in the Scottish Parliament, or could even vote for a member, and in Scotland an Episcopalian was always a Tory or a time-server, and even the assembly thus constituted could pass no law which had not been previously approved by a committee of courtiers. All that the government asked was readily granted. In a financial point of view, indeed, the liberality of the Scottish estates was of little consequence. They gave, however, what their scanty means permitted. They annexed in perpetuity to the crown the duties which had been granted to the late king, and which, in his time, had been estimated at forty thousand pounds sterling a year. They also settled on James for life an additional annual income of two hundred and sixteen thousand pounds Scots, equivalent to eighteen thousand pounds sterling. The whole sum which they were able to bestow was about sixty thousand a year, little more than what was poured into the English exchequer every fortnight. Having little money to give, the estates supplied the defect by loyal professions and barbarous statutes. The king, in a letter which was read to them at the opening of their session, called on them in vehement language to provide new penal laws against refractory Presbyterians and expressed his regret that business made it impossible for him to propose such laws in person from the throne. His commands were obeyed. A statute framed by his ministers was promptly passed, a statute which stands forth even among the statutes of that unhappy country at that unhappy period, pre-eminent in atrocity. It was enacted, in few but emphatic words, that whoever should preach a conventicle under a roof, or should attend, either as preacher or as hearer, a conventicle in the open air, should be punished with death and confiscation of property. This law, passed at the king's instance, by an assembly devoted to his will, deserves a special notice. For he has been frequently represented by ignorant writers as a prince rash, indeed, and injudicious in his choice of means, but intent on one of the noblest ends which a ruler can pursue the establishment of entire religious liberty. 
nor can it be denied that some portions of his life, when detached from the rest and superficially considered, seem to warrant this favourable view of his character. While a subject he had been, during many years, a persecuted man, and persecution had produced its usual effect on him, his mind, dull and narrow as it was, had profited under that sharp discipline. While he was excluded from the court, from the admiralty, and from the council, he was in danger of being also excluded from the throne, only because he could not help believing in transubstantiation and in the authority of the See of Rome. He made such rapid progress in the doctrines of toleration that he left Milton and Locke behind. What he often said could be more unjust than to visit speculations with penalties which ought to be reserved for acts. What more impolitic than to reject the services of good soldiers, seamen, lawyers, diplomatists, financiers, because they hold unsound opinions about the number of the sacraments or the pluripresence of the saints? He learned by rote those commonplaces which all sects repeat so fluently when they are enduring oppression, and forget so easily when they are able to retaliate it. Indeed, he rehearsed his lessons so well that those who chanced to hear him on this subject gave him credit for much more sense and much readier education than he really possessed. His professions imposed on some charitable persons, and perhaps imposed on himself, but his zeal for the rights of conscience ended with the predominance of the Whig party. When fortune changed, when he was no longer afraid that others would persecute him, when he had it in his power to persecute others, his real propensities began to show themselves. He hated the Puritan sects with a manifold hatred, theological and political, hereditary and personal. He regarded them as the foes of heaven, and as the foes of all legitimate authority in church and state, as his great-grandmother's foes, and his grandfather's, his father's and his mother's, his brother's and his own. He who had complained so fondly of the laws against papists, now declared himself unable to conceive how men could have the impudence to impose the repeal of the laws against Puritans. He whose favourite theme had been the injustice of requiring civil functionaries to take religious tests, established in Scotland, when he resided there as viceroy, the most rigorous religious tests that had ever been known in the empire. He who had expressed just indignation when priests of his own faith were hanged and quartered, amused himself with hearing Covenanters shrieks, and see them writhe while their knees were beaten flat in the boots. In this mood he became king, and he immediately demanded and obtained from the obsequious estates of Scotland, as the surest pledge of their loyalty, the most sanguinary law that has ever in our island been enacted against Protestant nonconformists. With this the whole spirit of his administration was in perfect harmony. The fiery persecution, which had raged when he ruled Scotland as vice-regent, waxed hotter than ever from the day on which he became sovereign. Those shires in which the Covenanters were most numerous were given up to the license of the army. With the army was mingled a militia, composed of the most violent and profligate of those who called themselves Episcopalians. Preeminent among the bands, which oppressed and wasted these unhappy districts, were the dragoons commanded by John Graham of Claverhouse. The story ran that these wicked men, used in their revels to play at the torments of hell, and to call each other by the names of devils and damned souls. The chief of this, Tophet, a soldier of distinguished courage and professional skill, but rapacious and profane, of violent temper and of obdurate heart, has left a name which, wherever the Scottish race is settled on the face of the globe, is mentioned with a peculiar energy of hatred. To recapitulate all the crimes by which this man, and men like him, goaded the peasantry of the western lowlands into madness, would be an endless task. A few instances must suffice, and all those instances shall be taken from the history of a single fortnight, that very fortnight in which the Scottish Parliament, at the urgent request of James, enacted a new law of unprecedented severity against dissenters. End of Part 8